Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. If I had to pick my favorite album of all time, it'd probably be... Well, it'd probably be really hard, but eventually I'd settle on Jethro Tull's Aqualung. It's just so perfect. Every song is amazing, and they all tie together without feeling the same. In fact, back in college, I performed the title track as part of my senior jury, so today I thought it'd be fun to break it down and see what's going on inside it. The song starts with this iconic riff. <laughs> And this is the part where I'd normally tell you what key we're in, but here it's not quite that simple. I can make pretty good arguments for at least three of these notes being the root. We don't have enough information yet, so I'll just cheat and look ahead at what's coming, and yeah, I don't think there is one. I think this is an example of what's called atonality. We tend to associate that word with dissonant styles like Schoenberg's 12-tone serialism, which is pretty much intentionally designed to be hard to listen to, but really atonality just means the music doesn't have an identifiable key center. You can make really beautiful, consonant atonal music. It's just not built around a single point. Once you're in the right mindset, atonal analysis can actually be a lot simpler than tonal stuff. Like, take this riff. We could try to guess the implied harmony like this and then try to explain what those chords are doing, but none of that really gets at the heart of the riff. It's not a progression, it's a shape. We start on a high note, fall down pretty far, then we try to walk back up to where we started, but the steps keep getting smaller. First a minor third, then a major second, then a minor second, then right when we're about to make it, we change directions and fall back down again. If that's not telling a story, I don't know what is. Anyway, then the chords come in, and we get this. Here we have three major triads in an ascending whole step line, which tends to sound pretty triumphant. It's reminiscent of what my friend 8-Bit Music Theory might call the Mario Cadence, because a similar progression is used at the end of many levels in the Super Mario games to mark your success. But in Aqualung, that success doesn't last very long, because before the last bar of that rise even ends, we get this... <laughs> where the progression starts to falter, moving back and forth between the last two chords, and then finally pushing just a little bit higher before falling all the way back down to where we started. Much like the riff, this part paints a pretty clear and pretty bleak portrait of Aqualung's life. After that, we get this. <laughs> And for this section, I'm gonna have to reach deep into my bag of analytical tricks and pull out some Neo-Riemannian analysis. That may sound like some rocket science stuff, but it's actually just a way of testing how close two chords are without relating them back to a particular key center, which is useful here because, again, we don't have one. For example, if we take E flat major and G flat major, we have what's called a chromatic mediant, where two chords are a third apart but don't share as many notes as we'd expect. The E flat major uses a G natural, whereas G flat major obviously uses a G flat. Neo Riemannian theory tells us that the chromatic mediant relationship is a pretty close one, so this move feels fairly well connected. But we don't go straight from E flat to G flat. The progression quickly dips down to D flat first before jumping up. Now, if we were in a key, the move from D flat to G flat could be read as 5 to 1 or 1 to 4. Either way, it'd feel pretty smooth, and even though the music is atonal, Neo Riemannian theory still views this sort of motion, which we might call dominant motion, as close, so the G flat chord feels pretty well set up. In the last bar, we've basically just got a walk down with some fancy decoration. Effectively, we're starting on that G flat chord again and sliding down to D major, kind of like the reverse of the walk up we started with. But if we just walked straight down, it'd sound boring, so they throw an unexpected B chord in the middle. Moving from E to B is dominant motion, and B to D is another chromatic mediant, so now that we know about Neo Riemannian theory, we can pretty safely say that both of those motions are close and thus smooth. This section may be full of chords we're not used to seeing next to each other, but with a little understanding of atonal harmony, it all fits together nicely. This intro also features an arranging trick that we'll see all over this song, and honestly, all over Toll's work in general progressive layering. The section starts with just the electric guitar and some drums. After a couple bars, the vocals come in, accompanied by the bass and an acoustic guitar. Then, on the third time through the progression, we're joined by a piano and a second electric guitar. Building up the orchestra like this helps lift the momentum of the section, and it keeps it interesting even though we're still playing the same thing. I want to talk about that second electric guitar for a minute, though, because it's doing something really cool. As we saw earlier, it's important that the chords we're hearing are all major, but if you play a major triad through distortion, it doesn't sound great. Distortion amplifies the inharmonic, unpleasant parts of the chords you run through it, and even something as consonant as a major triad isn't safe, so instead what they do is have the lead guitar just play the root and fifth, which sound fine together, then the other part fills in the major third. That puts it through a separate distortion filter so it doesn't interfere with the other notes, giving you a distorted major triad that still sounds pretty major. Anyway, from there we go into the verse? I don't know, sections are weird in this song, but it's the bit that sounds like this.
here, it seems like we've finally settled into a key, F major. Sort of. The section actually starts on G minor, which in this analysis would be the 2 chord. Starting on the 2 is interesting, because coming out of the atonal section we just heard, it almost implies that G is the root, but looking at the rest of the section, and especially the melody, which ends with a big ol' resolution to F, that doesn't seem to be the case. Still, the fakeout is interesting. That G minor quickly drops down to the actual 1 chord, F. We sit there for a while, then move to C, the 5 chord. Traditionally, the 5 chord wants to resolve back to the 1, but instead, Anderson subverts that expectation by moving to C minor. Minor, darkening the harmony and denying us the nice simple resolution we wanted. From there, he moves back to G minor, which even though we're in a key now, I think is still probably best explained by that neo riemannian dominant motion thing, and then we drop back down to F again and wrap up the progression. This section also features that progressive layering we were talking about, starting with just acoustic, adding in bass, then finally piano and drums. Eventually though, we wind up in the third section, which starts like this. <laughs> We'll talk about the chords in a minute, but first let's address the elephant in the room, the tempo. This section is a whole lot faster than the others, but it's not just a random new speed. It's using a technique called a metric modulation, which is where we shift from one tempo to another related one. Basically, if we take the half note from the old tempo, and split it up into three parts instead of two, we get the quarter note for the new tempo. We're effectively speeding up by 50%, but comparing it to the old tempo helps show how the two are connected. On the chords though, it's pretty simple. We're moving back and forth between G minor and F major, the two and one chords of the key. Or honestly, I think the new emphasis, coupled with a melody that leans more on G than F, implies that this section may actually be in the key of G minor, but it's hard to tell for sure, and since it's sandwiched between two sections in F, I think it's simpler to just read it all in the same key. If you'd rather analyze these as the one minor and flat seven chords though, I think that's totally valid. After that, we have a section of C minor, then F major. Then we see the verse-ish section again, but played at the new tempo and with a percussive pattern we've been seeing. Then we get to the breakdown, which is just the verse progression again, but with each chord played for twice as long. I won't dwell too long on the guitar line here, but I do want to briefly address it because it has an amazing interest curve. It starts with small little fragments, leaving a lot of space between them. The fragments get more and more rhythmically intricate until it comes to a peak about halfway through, then suddenly switches back to very simple three-note shapes before finally moving into a huge, super busy walk-up. It's a great illustration of how dramatic builds don't have to be linear. You can give your listener a chance to breathe between exciting moments. It helps keep them engaged. Anyway, that leads us into the solo, which is over a completely new progression. <laughs> Here, I think we have switched to G minor, starting on the 1 chord, dropping to flat 6, then walking back up to 1, kind of like that Mario cadence from earlier, but ending on a minor chord. At the end of the solo, the song suddenly drops back to the original tempo, and everyone disappears except for Anderson's voice and acoustic, playing the verse progression again. It's a huge, dramatic shift in tone, breaking up the massive hard rock vibe with something incredibly folky. It's Jethro Tull in a nutshell. After a little bit of that, we suddenly go back to the intro. This repetition gives the song a really cool sense of circularity, like it's just a day in Aqualung's life and he's gonna do the whole thing over again tomorrow. Nothing changes, he's still gonna be sitting on that park bench. It's a really weird song structure, but for the story they're telling, it totally works. Then the whole thing ends with what I like to call a Vegas ending, where the whole band just goes wild and plays a bunch of stuff all at once. I don't really have a good narrative explanation for that, but it sounds awesome and sometimes that's enough. And that's pretty much it, but before we go, quick announcement. There's a 12-tone Discord server now. If you've made it this far, I'm gonna guess you like music theory, so why not join and talk about music theory with other folks who also like music theory? Also, there's custom elephant emojis, so that's fun. Link in the description. Oh, also, we're switching things around on Patreon, so from now on, songs will be chosen by our patrons through a poll, so if you want to help us pick the next one, just head on over to Patreon. Bye! Oh, and thanks for watching, and thanks to Patreon patron Elias Helfer for suggesting this song. If you want to get updated on new 12-tone episodes, you can check out our mailing list, like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rockin'.